some of that while they're doing it. Amen. Preacher number one. Good evening, church, classmates. Um, I know we're a little nervous tonight, but I know the Lord will get us through it, so I mean, I encourage you guys just to, to stick with it and, and you know, knock through it. So. Um, tonight, we're going to be opening up with Luke 15. It's uh, Luke chapter 15, 20 through 24. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. It says this, So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to your servant, Quick, bring my best robe and put it on him. Put the ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So he and they began to celebrate. So tonight, um, I titled the sermon, From Dirt to Work. How many people know that what the world sees as failure, God sees as success? In 2 Kings, we see Elijah and Elisha. They're walking along, and they're on their way to the Jordan. And as they're going to the Jordan, Elijah looks at Elisha and says, ask anything before I'm taken, wow. anything. Wow. And so what he does is, he says, I'll ask for a double portion of your spirit. So when the chariots of fire came, they came and they, they took Elijah, his, Elijah, his, his cloak, it fell to the ground. Elijah walked over, he picked up that cloak and he again struck the water. When he struck the water, it parted and it says he walked along the, the ground. It was dry, completely dry. How many people know that that cloak, that cloak was the sign of the anointing? Yeah. So I might go through a, a various amount of, of, of scripture and I want you to stay with me. I'm going to go to my next scripture. It's found in Esther. Esther 3, 10 through 11. How many people know the story of Haman? Haman and Mordecai. Haman's walk, um, riding along. He's on his horse. And as he's on his horse, he, he tells all the men, he says, bow before me. Because he was, he was very boastful. He's very proud. But Mordecai, see, Mordecai, he wouldn't bow before them. Mordecai was a man of God. He knew that if he bowed before a man, that he wasn't a servant of the Almighty. But what the thing is, is because he wouldn't bow... More, uh, Haman, he heads off and he goes to the king and he says, if I could, in your name, if I could, I could fill out a, a document and, and you would just stamp it for me. See, he, the, the king, he had a ring, it's called the signet ring. He took that ring and he would stamp that document and whatever he said went. So what he, what he did is he was going to kill the Jews. So the king not only stamps it, he gives him the ring and says, here, you do it as you will please. So when he stamps it, anything goes. That was the signet ring, right? So I'm going to go a little further down in Ruth 4. We know the story of Ruth. Ruth, Ruth and Boaz. As Ruth was, was going to lose her lineage. She was going to lose everything. Her wealth, her valuables, her family, her last name, everything. But Boaz, see he wanted the redeemer, but he didn't have the legal right. The kinsman had the redeemer. See what they would do back then is a slave didn't have shoes. He would take his shoe off his feet. And as he would take that shoe off his feet, he would exchange it. What that was is it was a sign of transaction back then. So when they, they, they exchange, it was, I'm going to take on your lineage. I'm going to preserve your right. I'm going to save you. I'm going to take you off the streets, build you up. So what's going on now is, let's go back to the scripture. Let's go back to the original manuscript in Luke 15. It says this in Luke 15, 22. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring my best robe and put it on him. Put the ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. So what he's saying to him is, he's saying, no, I want you, I want to wrap you in the anointing, the cloak yeah. of the anointing. I want to take you, build you up, and I want to give you anointing from on high. And then he says this, he says, now better than that, I want to give you authority. I'm going to take my ring and I'm going to give it to you. You're an ambassador for Christ. You're going to do my work for me because I love you enough to. I'm going to give you authority. But then he goes as far as to say this. You're adopted. He takes his shoe off and switches it. You're adopted as sons and daughters Thank of the God. living God. Thank so what God. he's going, where I'm going with this is you're saying, where's, where are you going with this, Zach? This is an allegory. This is the gospel in the prodigal son. He took it and he's saying, you know what? What the world sees as coal, God, he sees as a diamond. How many people know underneath a lot of pressure and heat, a coal can be conformed to a diamond? Right. God looks at people right. like, Dr. Bell, you're a diamond. You know, Paige, you're a diamond. Josh, you're a diamond. Uh, Kate, you're a diamond. Uh, Emily, you're a diamond. God sees more worth in you than the world will ever see because you came from yeah. somewhere. You were somebody. 
You weren't somebody, but God makes you somebody because he turns nothing and makes something. Amen? So we're, tonight, I encourage you guys, don't be afraid. Stand up here boldly. You are an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. You are adopted. So I thank you guys for your time. You have a blessed night. Good evening. Please turn your Bibles with me to Galatians 1, verse 10. That is Galatians 1, verse 10. And it reads, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. My message is entitled tonight, God made us original, so do not become copies. It's sad that we live in a world today where people will do whatever it takes to be accepted by others. They will do whatever it takes to fit in. The meaning of being your own person is to do or be what one wishes or in accordance with one's own character rather than influenced by others. God has called you to be your own, not to be like everyone else. God has made each and every one of us different. There is, there is no one in this world that is the, the, like the exact same. In Christ is your true identity, your complete freedom to be who God has made and called you to be. If God wanted you different, he would have made you different. You are loved by God, not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. Let's talk about peer pressure. Peer pressure, I believe, is a struggle for everyone. But as Christians, it's important that we stick to our convictions. Stand up for what you believe in, even if you're standing alone. If you take a stand in your life with decisions, you may give others the courage to make right decisions in their lives. Growing up and to this day, I've always said to people, be your own person. Um, people will love you for who you really are if you stay true to who you are. And if they don't, then that's their problem. That's not yours. There are so many people that go through life trying to be like everyone else. Don't you ever let a soul in the world tell you that you cannot be exactly who you are. About all you can do in life is be yourself. Some will love you for who you are. Some will love you for, for what you do for others. And there's some people in life who won't even like you at all. John 15, 18 through 21 reads, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things... They will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. People are so easily influenced by the wrong things in life. And people are so easily influenced by even the wrong people. Be careful who you hang out with. Be careful who you choose for your friends. You need to choose wisely. Through my life, I've had to distance myself from people because of that. Proverbs 29, 25 reads, when you're afraid of what others will think of your decisions, it's like being caught in a trap. Don't let the real you get caught up in someone else's expectations for your life. Life is too short to be what others might expect you to be. Do not be afraid to be your own person, to express your ideas, to have faith, to believe in liberty because no one has a right to dictate your life. You are an individual uniquely inspired and worthy of a right to individuality. I have lost friendships over the years because of people and the decisions that they have decided to make in their lives. And I know that I'm not the only one. People don't realize that the decisions and the choices that they make in life, it doesn't only affect you, but it affects the people around you. And that's one thing that people need to understand. My, one of my old favorite songs is I'm Going On. And there is, there is a line in that song that says, so many lives depend on what I do. And people really need to grasp that because people, will, people watch you. They watch what you do. They watch what you say, how you act towards others. 
And it's something that we all need to remember that, you know, the things that we do, it doesn't only affect us, but it affects the people around us. There's so many things that are far beyond our control, and that's when we need to place them in God's hands. We cannot control what people do, and we cannot control what people say. But as Christians, we need to be good examples to others. In your desire to share the gospel, you may be the only Jesus someone will ever meet. Matthew 5, 16 reads, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Don't try to be like others. Don't walk in the footsteps of others. Create your own. People are often um, judged on their looks. They're labeled as one thing or another, and they're placed into categories. But you need to remember to not let yourself be defined by others. Judging a person does not define who they are. It defines who you are. Do not let the opinions of others define you. Don't be a copy. Be original. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Accepting yourself as you are and finding true friends and people who love you because you are that person will provide more comfort and popularity than any amount than any popularity, sorry, comfort than any amount of popularity ever could. Always be your own person. And no matter what, respect yourself enough to stay true to yourself and to God. Thank you. Amen. Hello, everyone. Um, please turn with me to 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. Um, I've entitled my thoughts today, Fight the Good Fight, and I'm reading from the NIV version. So, um, it says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered th from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So in the first verse of that, that would be 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. So is it wrong to have money? Is it a sin or evil to have money? This verse is not saying that it's a sin. It's saying that as soon as you let your money begin to control you, that's when it starts to become a sin. Um, it goes on to say some people eager for money have wandered far from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Um, having money becomes a sin when it controls you. And when you no longer think about what God would want you to do with that money, but you think about what your flesh would want to do with that money. Um, when you no longer want to sow that into the ministry of God, but rather go spend it at the mall or at the new eat eating place. Um, this is stressed again in Hebrews 13.5. It says... Keep your lives free from the money and be content with what you have. As soon as your love for money and material things and possessions become greater than your love for God, that's when you start to fail. Um, in doing this, you're making an idol of your money and your material things, which conflicts with your relationship with God. And at this point, if after you've given pretty much your whole life to your money rather than God, it becomes a sin and that's when you start to fall away from God. It rips you away from God. Um, it continues in verse 11, and it says, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So here it's, okay. this is the word of God, and it is straight up telling you to flee. Flee from your sins. And if you don't know what flee means, in the dictionary it says flee is to run away from a place or situation of danger. Sin is a danger. It's dangerous. You don't want to be around sin. All it's going to do is pull you away from God and drag you down, and you're not going to be the man of, or woman of God that you want to be. Um, sin is dangerous, like I've said already. God has provided an exit and a way out, a safe haven, and a place where you can be sheltered, and that's in his presence, and you need to remain in his presence at all times. Um, you can do this by continuing to read your word, just praying at all times when you get, whenever you can think of anything to pray about, just pray. And um, it continues to say, um, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and endurance, and gentleness. 
So um, you need to continue to just pull yourself towards that. And um, like it says, flee. Seek after those things, the righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going to be easy to get up and walk away from your sin. It's going to be hard. And I'm sure many of you here can uh, testify to the fact that it's not going to be easy to follow God. And um, it's going to be hard. And it will be hard. So um, it's a fight. So that's when we continue to read uh, verse 11. And it says, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you, were made, when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. There's power in this sentence, fight the good fight. Um, following God's not easy, and it's a battle. It's a battle, and Satan's going to continue to ask you daily, how can I believe something that I can't even see? Um, if God is real, then why do horrible things happen to me? And they're his weapons of his warfare, those questions that he's going to ask you. He's going to throw them at you like grenades. But we have weapons too. Our weapons are prayer and God's word, seeking God through everything, and giving him the glory and praise even when we don't want to. And that's the heavy artillery that we need to fight back. You just need to continue to practice your aim and point your heart in the direction of God in all things that you do because he's the one who's going to guide you on the right paths that you need to be on. Um, in Romans 8, 31, it says, What shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Um, um, and then it continues. Uh, it says it again in Hebrews 13. It says, Because God has said... Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do? Um, it says, uh, God is with you and he will never forsake you. Um, he's always going to be on your side, so nothing can rise against you. And when Satan tries to challenge you and pull you down and beat you down and pull you away from your relationship with God, that's when you need to just continue to pull yourself closer to God. In Romans 16, 20, it says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus will be with you. And I would like to leave you with a challenge. To follow God in every aspect of your life and with your whole heart. Live only to give the glory to God. And I would like to encourage you to fight the good fight of faith. And in the end, when you face God, you'll be able to say, just like in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight of faith. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Thank you. Good evening, children of God. If you would, please turn your Bibles to Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 7. That's Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. The first thing King Solomon tells us to do in this passage is that we need to give our words to God. We need to completely trust in his grace and his power and his mercy to sustain us. Even if we're going through something that is a huge challenge to us and we, seem, we see that it might be impossible for us. 1 Peter 5, verse 6-7 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I'm so glad of God's caringness and his grace that keeps me through. I would not be preaching to you guys tonight if it wasn't for God's grace, if it wasn't for the peace he gives me. You see, I do not have the ability in myself to do this. It is all God, I believe. I believe God is using me. This is my calling to preach the gospel. And I want to share with you guys that worry is pride. Because when we worry, we're basically saying to God, you are not worthy of our praise, and that you are not going to get us out of the situation. But we need to be, get beyond ourselves and our own way of thinking. We need to get beyond that. We need to look to the cross of Jesus Christ. Because when we worry, that keeps us from God. 
yeah. keeps us from his promises and his grace. Our God is so great. We need to realize who we serve, this God who we serve. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, oh, Christ died for us. We didn't save ourselves. So why do we worry about these things that don't matter? For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that aren't seen are eternal. He died for us. We didn't save ourselves. So we have no reason to doubt him. We never have a reason to doubt him, to doubt his grace and his peace, the peace that passes all understanding. We have no reason to doubt this at all. He is always with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He created our very being. He knows exactly what will happen to us. And he promises he'll always be there to pick us up. When we're down in the valley, he will always promise to bring us up to the mountain. When we realize this, we can go further in our walk with God. We can never get too close to God. Right. He's always there. He always listens to our requests. See, when I was growing up, I would always think that God is too busy for someone like me. And that caused me to doubt him. That caused me to even doubt his existence. But God is really showing me that he can give me peace that passes all understanding. And nobody can even comprehend that. I can't even comprehend that. This is amazing, just me speaking here. Like, I don't even... I really cannot do this in my own flesh. I give all glory to God. Every single bit of it. Amen. He will help you in your struggles. He will help you in these circumstances that may seem impossible. Right. See, our God is great. We serve a great God. Oh, yeah. We need to rely on this wisdom from above. Not wisdom of own human terms. Not our own wisdoms and philosophies. Not others' philosophies. But we need to rely and trust completely in God. For He will sustain us. He will give us purpose and meaning and hope as we trust in him. He also promises us wisdom. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. This wisdom will not only give you peace, but it will give you, help you to fight the evil one. See, we can't fight the devil in our own flesh. We can't fight him on our own. We need a greater power. And that power is Jesus Christ. We need, we need him so much. He is every breath in our lungs. He is the air we breathe. He is a step in our footstep. He is everything we could ever need. Amen. We can't even breathe. We can't stand without him. So why do we try to do things on our own? Why do we try to fight things that we shouldn't be fighting? I want to challenge you guys tonight to give everything to God. That includes your worries, your fears, your doubts, Anything that could ever hinder you from getting in God's presence. As, a, as growing up, being in elementary school, junior high, high school, I was very shy and I would freeze up, get clammy hands when I would do something like this. And I believe it's only the peace of God that I'm able to do this. It's not in myself. And I give all glory to God because he is so worthy of our praise. He's such a great God. He's so good. And we just grasp that, how good he is and how much peace he gives us. And the wisdom that just helps us to fight every battle on our knees. As right. we cry out to God, he will be there for our strength. He chooses the weak things to bring strength. And I would like to share some lyrics to a song that really inspired me. It says, this is where I end and this is where you start. And everything I needed is everything you are. And that's so true. When we come to our, the, when we realize that when we come to the end of ourselves and we completely realize that God is our everything and that we begin with him, we end with ourselves, we will see great changes in our lives and in others' lives. And it gives us peace that we can't even comprehend, peace that is so great and amazing because our God is great. Amen. Thanks. Good evening. I hope everybody's having a great night. Um, tonight my text comes from the second chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, verses 10 to 11. If you would, please turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. It reads, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. 
My heart took delight in all my work, and this was a reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. I entitled the, my message tonight, The Meaning of Life. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, what is the meaning of all this? What is the purpose of life? Most of us have probably wondered that at one point or another. Life is a quest for meaning. We all want our lives to count for something, and we want to leave this earth knowing that our purpose has been fulfilled. In the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon wonders the exact same thing. He goes from one worldly pleasure to another, trying to find the meaning of life. He tried everything from scientific discovery to alcohol and luxury. Solomon tried all worldly things, yet none of them satisfied him. He realized that he was missing one thing, God. King Solomon depended on worldly things to fulfill him rather than God. What are you depending on to make your life worth living? Work, pleasure, beauty, money. What you get out of bed each morning for it is what you live for. Solomon states very clearly that everything is meaningless without God. Man is always in a state of emptiness without God in his life. In chapter 12, verse 8, he states, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. He wants us to know that we need to keep God number one. Whatever we put before God will surely bring us disappointment and leave us feeling empty. When we put something before God, say a relationship, a friendship, whatever it is, and that thing gets taken away from us, mm -hmm. we're left in a state of misery and disappointment. Right. But if we keep God number one, right. we will never have to worry about that because we will have constant joy in our lives. Amen. Solomon informs us that there is no enjoyment whatsoever under the sun without God. God himself is what is necessary for enjoyment. If we do our tasks and our work in and through him, there can be joy because he alone is our joy. Right. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me yeah. with joy in your presence with yeah. eternal pleasures at your right hand. Yeah. All things in this life, they become wearisome and tiresome, not providing what the soul ultimately longs for. But our soul longs for a personal relationship with God. He wants us to come to him with everything, whether it's a joy or a concern, whether it's big or small, it doesn't matter to God. He just wants us to talk to him and have, it, have an intimate relationship with him. Amen. Just think about this. Even millionaires are unhappy. They spend their whole lives making money, yeah. billions of it, spending it on whatever they want. Yet there are so many who cheat on their spouses, they commit crimes, and they even take their own lives. Right. King Solomon said he had seen everything under the sun. He had 700 wives, received over 25 tons of gold each year, and had a net worth of, listen to this number, over $46,630,656,000. He had everything his heart desired, yet it still wasn't enough. Don't waste your time seeking happiness in something you won't find, because money and fame, they can't buy you happiness. But if you seek God, you will find him. In the very first verse of the book, Solomon says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I want to tell you a little about the word vanity. Vanity comes from the Hebrew word hebel, which means vapor or puff of air, that which vanishes quickly and leaves nothing behind. Solomon is trying to tell us that all our life is is a puff of air, here one second and gone the next. Yeah. It's so quick. James 4.14 says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Are you going to waste your time chasing after meaningless worldly things? Or are you going to get serious about God? Solomon used the word vanity 38 times in Ecclesiastes, and he used the phrase under the sun 29 times. The phrase under the sun refers to the realm where vanity reigns. Our world is under the sun. So when you put it this way, all toil is under the sun, everything under the sun is vanity, and therefore all toil is vanity. There is a meaning and purpose, purpose to life that far exceeds our stuff. We realize that there is nothing new under the sun. We do the same thing over and over and over again, and then we die. Mm -hmm. We always need something newer, a new upgraded iPhone, a faster computer, a bigger TV. We need a TV with a better picture, 3D, Blu-ray, HD, you name it, we need it. <laughs> the thing you used to love, it just doesn't do it anymore. We think this new thing will make life better, but it won't. Is there a beyond the sun that breaks into life under the sun? Yes, Jesus. Jesus did something new for us. He died for us. We spend billions 
and billions of dollars trying to create happiness and amusement, but God's gift of salvation is free. We can have complete joy for free. God takes us and makes us into something new, something that this world can't invent or can't buy. Even the Lord asks, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? We are created to give our lives to God and to live for him. He is the only one that can bring us meaning and life. John 1, 3 says, through God, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. God infuses all life with meaning because he gives life purpose. In Solomon's final conclusion, he presents four pictures of life and attaches to each picture practical advice for his readers to heed. Number one, life is an adventure lived by faith. Number two, life is a gift, enjoy it. Number three, life is a school, learn your lessons. And number four, life is a stewardship, fear God. So I want to leave you with this question. What are you living for? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting with verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. You see, these aren't small things that Paul was talking about. <clears throat> you can speak angelically. You can speak with the tongues of angels. You can know exactly what to say to somebody at exactly the right time. But that doesn't matter. If you don't have love in your heart, how are they going to receive that? Right. <clears throat> you can have knowledge, understand all mysteries and all knowledge. You can know the Bible front to back. Right. You can know <clears throat> that there's 66 books in Bible, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. But what good does that do someone? If you don't love on them, <laughs> it's worth nothing. You can even practice true religion. <clears throat> you can give all your goods to feed the poor. You can, you can live like a martyr. But it doesn't matter because if you don't love on that person that needs it, how are they going to see Christ through you? They're not. They're going to say, oh, they serve a God of love. Why aren't they living a life of love? We need to be like Christ. Christ who ate with sinners. Do you even understand that? Our God is a God that is above all things, but he puts himself beneath people. How can we be a servant of a God who puts himself beneath people, but we put ourselves on a high pedestal? Christ loved those that were beneath him. And you know what? If we act like we're above everyone, we're no better than the Pharisees. Christ loved us so much that we sin against him every single day. Every time we sin, he feels pain. Do you realize that? And he loves us just the same. And he forgives us every single time. John 15, 13 says, <clears throat> there's no greater love than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. Mm -hmm. Do you feel love for people so deeply that you're willing to lay down your life for them? Because that's what Christ did. Right. Aren't we supposed to live like Christ? but hardly any of us do that. What are we willing to do to know Christ? Matthew 7, 
Matthew 7, 22 and 23 says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness? What is that supposed to mean? These people, they were living for God, obviously, right? They were prophesying. They were casting out demons. They performed many wonders. How could they be lawless? If you look to Matthew 22, 37 to 40, it says, And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Hang all the law in the prophets. That means that no matter what law we break, if we don't love people, then we're meaningless. In the end times, God's going to look at us, and if we didn't love people, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. So let me leave you with this. Who are we without love? Thank you.